in case you were curious. Today our scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 14 through 21. And to give you an idea, this as well as one of the other verses that we are going to, I'm going to read in the sermon happen to be the um, part of the uh, big bulk of the theological foundation for my dissertation. So you're getting to hear part of it today. <laughs> and if it sounds dumb, then I'll go rewrite my dissertation. <laughs> but this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And to give you a quick little background, this is the second letter to the church in Corinth. And one of the things that the church in Corinth struggles with is understanding their purpose as a church. What they're supposed to be doing. How they're supposed to treat each other. And so Paul writes to him and says, this is what you do. This is what we are about as followers of Christ. And this to me is one of the most unbelievably awesome passages in scripture um, aside from the whole love God, love your neighbor and all sorts. So from there. So this is, well I'm, some, I'm doing the, this part. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. <clears throat> I'm going to have to read it from up here so I know. You see, the controlling force in our lives is the love of the anointed one. And our confession is this, one died for all, therefore all have died. He died for us so that we will all live, not for ourselves, but for him, him who died and rose from the dead. Because of all that God has done, we now have a new perspective. We used to regard people based on worldly standards and interests alone. No longer. We used to think of the anointed one the same way. No longer. <clears throat> Therefore, if anyone is united with the anointed one, that person is a new creation. The old life is gone and see a new life has begun. <clears throat> All of this is a gift from our Creator God who has pursued us and brought us into a restored and healthy relationship with Him through the Anointed One. And He has given us the same mission, the Ministry of Reconciliation, to bring others back to Him. It is, the central, it is central to our good news that God was in the anointed, making things right between himself and the world. This means he does not hold their sins against them. But it also means he charges us to proclaim the message that heals and restores our broken relationship with God and each other. So... We are now representatives of the Anointed One, the Liberating King. God has given us a charge to carry through our lives, urging all people on behalf of the Anointed One to become reconciled with their Creator. He orchestrated this. The Anointed One, who had never experienced sin, became sin for us, so that in Him, we might embody the very righteousness of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> Let us pray. Dear gracious and almighty God, it was you who had no sin that became sin for the sole purpose of of reconciling us to you and to each other. You came into this world so that we could know wholeness and healthy relationships, not only with you, God, but with one another. You came into this world so we can, we can feel and be the message of wholeness and hope and reconciliation in this world. Almighty God, Help us to pick up this mission, to pick up this mantle, to choose to follow in your way, in your footsteps, and to set out ourselves as peacemakers, as reconcilers, 
as cleansing whole holistic leaders for the faith cleansing God clear out of our hearts and souls everything that's keeping us from being that we lay them down at your feet today and Christ glorious cleansing God you are the clear example of what it means to be loved God it must be your words that are heard today and not mine it must be your way that we follow and not just our own in your name we pray Amen it was a great week last week celebrating Easter and the truth of the risen Son Wow what an amazing gift for me that is one of the most amazing stories to get to tell one of the most beautiful messages that a preacher can give to tell the world light has come darkness was overcome clearly God's love is is that which will endure forever as a preacher to get the chance to tell the people in your congregation and around the world that you don't have to live in brokenness you don't have to experience hurt and pain forever that you can know healing that you can experience wholeness what what a gift for those of you here in this room that have experienced and know what it means to have had your dark days and now are walking in the light for those of you who know what it's like to once be lost but now found wow that feeling of wholeness that feeling of hope that feeling of restoration and reconciliation there's really not words to describe it you see the story of Easter the message of Easter is amazing it's powerful it's so glorious to be able to say God lives death cannot keep him down and because God lives I can live because he lives we can face tomorrow because he lives we know all fear is gone what a holy message what a restoring message what a great message and every single one of us I know loves that embraces that relishes in it and on Easter Sunday we celebrate it even more with our beautiful services dressing up as fancy as we feel like we want to be that day which the operative word there is we feel like we want to be even on Easter Sunday I never like to wear the dress my mother made me wear except I did like the hats those were cute we know that hope and love and it's an amazing message it's a message the world needs to know the world needs to hear I mean look just around us how many people we hear and see are experiencing hurt and pain and brokenness and they need to know that God loves them that God will raise them up that God gives them a chance to walk in the light that 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 they can know hope and renewal and that we can turn towards good and the place that you're supposed to know that that you're supposed to be able to experience that is within the church and and you would think with such a powerful message with such a beautiful message that all the churches in the world will be busting at the seams but the problem is in the United States particularly in the United States the mainline church is on massive decline I, I, lo I looked in the last couple of months I've been doing a lot of research on on what's happening with our numbers as a denomination and 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 I looked and and within our conference alone we have been on a steady decline we have only 52,000 people that attend services in the United Methodist Church in Oklahoma but the state of Oklahoma has nearly 10 million people in population there's a disconnect 
if we have this message, when we know, if you heard just this week, all the people who are dealing with, with the reality that, that the mental health funds are going to be cut from the state benefits, and that means that these are people who are dealing with brokenness and hurt and pain that need the message of Christ, and there's this massive number, yet our numbers are declining. What's going on? I think the reason why is because many churches out there have forgotten what it means to be the church. Many churches out there have forgotten our definition, have forgotten our message, have forgotten why we all are here this morning. And so over the next six weeks, we're going to remind ourselves. Now I'll tell you, here in this building, in this room, I can't, I can't explain how many people walk in and say, this is church. This is what it's supposed to be. And so, while many of us here might feel like we get it, there are many out there that don't. And so we need to shout even brighter, even louder, even stronger. This is what it means to be the church. This is what it means to follow in God's kingdom. So for the next six weeks, we're not only going to look at what it says in Scripture, but we're also going to look at our own story. We're going to look at our own story as a congregation of what it means to be the body of Christ through new horizon. I encourage you to ask one another, why are you here? But not like accusatively, why are you here? But you know, in the kind, compassionate, what brought you here? There's some great stories out there. Ask Lila hers. It's pretty amazing. Makes me cry when she tells it to me. Ask everybody, why this church? Ask each other, what does the church mean to you? And that will help us understand how to tell our story to others, how to find the others. But before we get there, I want us to dialogue a little bit about God's call on us as the church. Because you see, like I told the kids, in the end, the church is not the building, the church is not the steeple, the church is not a resting place, although it is comfortable to sleep on my couch when I need to take a nap. And those couches are too. The church is the people. You see, the reason why the church is the people is because that's the sole reason Christ came, was to restore right and healthy relationships between us and the Father and us and one another. That the reason we exist, the reason He lives, the reason He overcame the darkness was so that He could say, look, we can live anew. We can live in good relationships with one another. We can live in a relationship with God and one another that brings wholeness and hope and not hurt. And when we, as the church, lose sight of relationships as a focus, when we think it's all about the building, or it's all about the this or the that, and we forget about the people that are coming, when we forget about the relationships, we lose sight of God's call. You see, every single one of you, when you ask each other your story, will say it's because so-and-so showed me God's love. It's because I didn't feel alone. It's because they connected with me. It's because this person or that person or this whole church or this whole group because they showed me the Holy Spirit. In today's passage, it makes it very clear what we are supposed to be about. If you look at the... Hello. There we go. Starts off, Paul starts off by saying, look, this is how we used to look at the world. He says, he explains who Christ is. He says that he died for us so that we will all be able to live. He says that we, he, because Christ died for our sins, we too have let, had that chance to die for our sins and let those go and rise again in the way of Christ. He says because of all God has done, now we have a new perspective. So what that means then, in this building, in this room, in this group of people, we see the world through his eyes and not through the world's eyes. 
We don't judge as the world judges. We don't treat each other as the world might treat each other. We share God's love. We share compassion. We share hope. We share peace. We don't drive hate. We don't drive harm. We don't drive anger. Instead, we drive a form of biblical love that can only be found in the way of Christ. And so we no longer look at, the, at people this way. We look at people through the eyes of Christ. So therefore, if anyone is united in Christ, we are new. We are a new creation. We are restored to God's love. And all of this is a gift from our Savior. But here is this last sentence. It says that we were restored and brought us into restored and healthy relationships with, with God through Christ. And he has given us the same mission. That mission is referring to the mission of Christ. Christ's mission was to restore us to right relationship with God and one another. And he has given us the same mission. Now that doesn't mean we're going to be Christ. But that our responsibility as followers of Christ is to bring people into a chance and a place to experience this great message that we have. That you can know hope. You can know healing. You can know God's love. And our responsibility is to bring them to the foot of Christ and to share God's love with them. To be agents of God's reconciling love. Our mission is the same as Christ's. To bring about peace. To find the broken and help them find their way to hope and restoration. To bring others back to Him. In Ephesians 2, 14 through 18, it says that Christ Himself is our peace. And that through Him, He has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. Between God the Father and humanity, and between us and each other. So if that is why he came, what he did, he destroyed that wall, then that's what we're about. We are about bringing forth God's reconciling love. As a church, we are to be this massive agent of transformation in the world. We are to be this force to be reckoned with. We are to be God's love and to find the broken. As a church, we've had a history of this. We've had a history of being His light in a dark world. Whether it be praying and protesting against nuclear war back in the early 80s, or it be about finding those that have lost their job and lost their things and said, we need to make sure that at least their kids have something for Christmas. And we began the toy giveaway. At one point, we were a place for the Alcoholic Anonymous meetings to come because we wanted them to know you have a place here. We've begun that same ministry again to say, come here, we will give you a place to find a meal and friendship. But we must remember that our ministry, this is our call. And we must encourage those in other places to continue down that route. In um, 1992, uh, Russia opened and communism fell and the country opened and as United Methodist Church here in Oklahoma we actively began to pursue relationships there and I had the wonderful benefit of it being my father that led that charge so I got to hear a lot of stories a lot of stories there were several times that in that in those uh, I guess it was six years that dad was actively going over every few months um, there were times we were afraid that some of the communist strongholds were going to take him. But one particular story that matters so much to me, I want to share with you today. You see, on one of the trips, I think this was maybe around 93, 
there was a woman, her name was Irina, and she was their translator. And Irina was basically an atheist. I mean, she grew up in a family where her grandmother still went to the Orthodox Church and all that, but, but she didn't really. And she didn't really care. And she was having, she was just, she had been a translator. It was basically her profession. And she had been a translator for so long that as translators, you kind of just uh, turn into a robot. And no matter what, you like hear the words come in here, you say them out in the right language, and then you forget them. And, and she never really listened to what was being said back and forth. And one of the things that we focused on doing when we would go into Russia is we would focus on making sure that, um, that we met needs first. We didn't just come in and say, hey, you need Jesus. We said, hey, what can we do? We want to be a friend. Because for those of us that remember the Cold War, Russians and Americans were not necessarily friends. And so we started off by developing reconciling relationships. How can we get along? How can we learn to be an exchange, cultural exchange, just friendships? And so we spend several trips just building relationships. And there's one trip in particular, Irina is the translator. She had found out that, that there was just a lot of family problems. I, I think it was her favorite uncle was dying. And she was really grieving because she just couldn't get to be by his bedside. And it was okay. she's like, no, he's not going to die before you all leave. It's okay. I, I don't mind staying. But she was really hurting and felt very empty. And she was questioning and wondering where she was supposed to be. And was this really, she was, she was feeling without a purpose. And, and the team just loved on her. Took care of her. Embraced her. Walked with her. And one night as they were preparing for service, they had heard that her uncle was really not doing well. And there's not only Americans, but also Russians there in the circle. And so they are asking, they're in a prayer circle, and they're asking Irina to translate the prayer that they were going to say. And as they're praying around for different things, she hears this one guy, one pastor named Mike, start to pray for her. And she's translating these words, and she's like, wait, these are about me. And she then, that night, for the first time in the worship service later, actually listened to the words she was translating about a God who loved her, about a God who would save her, who would give her hope and a purpose. And as she's translating this, she's realizing these people live what I'm telling them, what they're telling them about. At the end of the service, they ask anyone who wants to commit to Christ to come forward. And up comes the translator, and the dad's like, whoa, all right, cool, yay! <laughs> and Irina commits herself to Christ. <coughs> Fast forward to today. Irina is now the district superintendent for the largest Methodist district in Russia. She oversees two churches herself and has started, I believe, a total of three, no, I'd say five churches. She is the, I'm going to get goosebumps in Christ. She is the greatest force for Christ in southern Russia that I know of right now. This woman wants to go in and build reconciling relationships with absolutely everybody she can because she heard the message. Her church, when it comes into an area, becomes this example for transformation. People are saved, transformed, and moved through that church community in ways I cannot imagine. It was all because somebody shined the light and the church was the church for her. So over these next few weeks, let's ask ourselves, what does it mean to be the church? Who are the Irenas in our life that need to hear God's love for the first time? Who are the men and women that are hurting and need the hope of this community? Who are we called to be the church with?
church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. Let us be the church. Amen.